ambassador at Beth Van Check in prior times when she was at the International Humanitarian Law and Dialogues. Yes. She was Professor Beth Van Check, and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, the question we were asking off camera is, are you destined to be a lawyer? I was not destined to be a lawyer. I went through college as a human biology major, mm -hmm. and I was thinking about a career in public health. I always knew I wanted to work with people and I wanted to improve the lives of people, but I wasn't sure precisely what the best pathway of that was. Right after college, I received a fellowship from the Rotary Foundation actually to go to Kenya, East Africa, and to do a project in women's health. And while I was there working in women's health, I became increasingly interested in issues of human rights and rights more broadly. And so when I returned from that experience, I made a pivot, and rather than going to public health school, I went to law school. And the rest is history. So you were at Stanford, right? No, I actually went to Yale Law School. I was at Stanford as an undergraduate. Okay, undergrad, Stanford, and then Yale. And do you remember some of your professors at Yale Law School? I do. In fact, a really transformative experience was working in the human rights clinic with Professor Harold Coe, who later served as the head of the Human Rights Bureau at the State Department and then as the legal advisor to the State Department. And so he always had a very pragmatic approach to international law and to human rights, and I found that very appealing. And so working with him to bring the law into action, to work actually on behalf of real clients, was incredibly exciting versus sitting in a classroom, reading stale cases. Um, I felt very, in a way, almost disoriented my first year of law school because I'd come to do human rights work and I was reading these old cases for in property law and civil procedure and this and that. And then at some point during that year, working with Harold Coe, who had brought a number of cases under the alien tort statute, I sort of clued into the fact that torture was a tort. And that suddenly made all of my course of study suddenly incredibly relevant. I got why I was taking torts. I got why I needed to take civil procedure because I needed to understand how to bring cases in US courts. I understand why property law was relevant because transitional justice, a huge piece of that is reparations. And so really understanding how property rights are um, adjudicated and, and accorded to individuals was relevant. And so the whole course of study in law school became newly relevant to me. And, and it was very much working in that human rights clinic that brought that home for me. Uh, we just recently had Professor Reva Siegel here. Was she there at your time? She was, and in fact, I was maybe going to be her research assistant. I ended up helping to run the clinic because Harold got called into government service, and so he needed a student to be a sort of full-time teaching assistant for the clinic, and so I ended up working with him instead. But she was obviously a champion on the faculty, one of the few tenured women at the time that I was a student there, um, and she was just beloved and admired by so many of us who knew we wanted to be doing civil rights work, women's rights work, and maybe even being a professor. She was a wonderful role model. She was a Jackson lecturer here at Chautauqua <coughs> just a, a month or so ago. In fact, I have your lecture bookmarked. I just haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but I do in incredibly intend to. Yeah. And I interviewed her husband as well. Oh, team, interesting. Uh, who had just finished uh, writing a, a book uh, on the Holmes device. So Great. That, that was fun. So here you are. You were now at Yale Law School. And was there an aha moment here? There was, in fact. It's funny that you asked that question because a lawyer who was very early with the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, Payam Akhavan, who's a Canadian mm -hmm. of Iranian descent, a Baha'i, his family fled due to persecution within Iran. He was invited to Yale to give a talk, and he was talking about the revival of the Nuremberg principles with the ICTY and how there was this moment where the international community was again united around the imperative of justice and accountability. And I was just fascinated by his lecture, and he was describing how, you know, they were literally building this tribunal from scratch. They were digging up these old precedents from the post World War II period, but very little had been done in the meantime, and so everything was a blue sky question. And I thought to myself, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And so when I was getting close to graduating, I reached back out to him um, quite boldly and said, I would love to come and work with you. How do we do this? And in the end, I was awarded a fellowship from the Open Society Institute 
a two-year fellowship to study and engage in this new project of international criminal justice. And they enabled me to go and work with the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICTY. Payam was my boss. We worked on a number of cases, including the Tadic case, which was sort of the Marbury versus Madison of the tribunal, incredibly important, but a number of other additional cases that set really key precedent that have really guided the field now going forward. So at the ICTY at the time, who was the pros chief prosecutor? It was Louise Arbor. Okay. And so seeing this incredible woman also at the lead of this organization. And it was at a time when there really was no profession of being an international criminal lawyer. Mm -hmm. We were drawing from our staff from a number of different sources. So we had a number of human rights lawyers, and that's where I sort of found myself in community. We had a number of military lawyers who had served in their respective departments of defense around the world. Um, and there were a number of also just ordinary criminal lawyers who had done big systemic cases or organized crime cases and had been, some of them, seconded from their national system. And so we had this group of three different types of lawyers trying to figure out how to work together to bring these cases that had not been brought since the post-World War II period. And it was so interesting to see us all trying to learn each other's language and to work together to bring these cases forward before the ICTY. What, I mean, Louise was the chief, and so what skill set did she bring to make that a reality? Did she bring? She was remarkable, and I think this is probably true for all of the most successful chief prosecutors of the war crimes tribunals. They obviously have to be ace lawyers. They have to be excellent criminal law lawyers. She's from Canada. She was from Canada. But they also have to be diplomats, ultimately, right? Their, their, their work is situated within a broader system of international, um, of international law and of international organizations. And so being able to get the support of the Security Council, of the General Assembly, of the wider United Nations, of individual states who were seconding individuals, who were providing various forms of bilateral support to the tribunal. So she was you know, both a, an ace lawyer and then a diplomat. And then she also needed to be able to operate in very difficult situations. And so she was constantly in the former Yugoslavia and down in Rwanda and in Arusha trying to ensure state cooperation. And the Yugoslavia work was at a time when there were v many, many fugitives. And so there was a real challenge to try and find ways to get those fugitives brought to The Hague so that those cases could move forward. And so she had to be negotiated constantly, not only with the states of the former Yugoslavia, many of whom were very reluctant to turn over their nationals, but also with peacekeeping forces who didn't really see capturing fugitives as part of their mandate. Mm -hmm. And so she had to convince them that, in fact, that would bring about peace and security within the regions in which they were trying to engage in peacekeeping to get these guys out of the field and into The Hague where they could stand trial. Yeah, that, was it still the time when the ICTY and the ICTR were together? Yes, we had a joint prosecutorial office yeah. um, and a joint appeals chamber as well. So it was very much the trial chambers were separate, but much of this got fed in. And the unit that I was assigned to was sort of a theory unit that was supposed to be helping to harmonize the work of the, pros the prosecutor's office across the various situations. And so we would get sort of big ticket questions like, how are we going to charge incitement to genocide? How are we going to charge conspiracy? And some of the work that I was doing as a very junior lawyer at the time was doing the comparative research to try and lay the groundwork for general principles of law. So what, what did conspiracy look like in the various systems around the world? How do we deal with hearsay evidence, for example? And one of the most interesting experiences I was involved in was there was a question of hearsay, in fact. And we had a... Um, defendant who hailed from a civil law system, who had a civil law lawyer, where normally in the civil law systems, most evidence comes in and it's for the judge to sort of weight that evidence. There aren't very strict rules of evidence. And then we had a common law prosecutor who was used to the hearsay bar and the need to find and satisfy very specific um, exceptions to the hearsay rule in order for any kind of hearsay to come in. We have the business rules, ex business um, documents exception, or the excited utterance exception, etc. And yet their roles were completely swapped. So the civil law lawyer wanted to keep hearsay out, and the common law prosecutor wanted to get hearsay in. So they had to completely reverse the roles that they were used to from their national system. And to me, it really struck home how this tribunal was having to meld 
very different legal systems who often have very different and disparate rules that they're governed by, um, and yet we had to come up with a common set of rules of procedure and evidence. And to see the common law lawyer arguing for the free admission of evidence and the civil law lawyer saying that there should be a hearsay bar under international law was just fascinating. So you're there for how long? I was there for about a year mm -hmm. as an intern. I then went to the Rome conference where I was the head of delegation of a Geneva-based organization. 1998. 1998, the, the International Service for Human Rights. I had been an intern with them in law school and they asked me to lead their delegation. So I pulled together a group of young, sort of vibrant, idealistic young lawyers who wanted to, to see this tribunal being built. And so we all moved to the moved to, to Rome. I had a small apartment that the Amnesty International office was able to provide for us. We slept on the floor. People were cycling in and out. It was just this incredibly heady time. Um, and then I went back to San Francisco where I was planning to settle and worked with the Center for International Justice, the Center for Justice and Accountability, which is a, essentially a human rights law firm that was mostly focused at the time on domestic litigation within U.S. courts. Now it's expanded its, its remit much more broadly to work in a whole range of courts around the, around the world. I'm going to stop for a second on 1998, the Rome Treaty, you're there. Yep. You know, I wasn't. I remember reading about it. But, I mean, you're, you're kids. Yeah, we were in the tw our 20s, absolutely. Yeah. And was there an awe factor? Was there an idealistic factor? What was it that drove you guys? It definitely felt like we were building a new world order. It was incredibly exciting in that regard. And seeing all of the states coming together and grappling with some of the questions that needed to be answered in order to build an entirely new court system, one that had been envisioned back in the post-World War II period, but it had not been able to come to fruition during that time. And it was only now, with the demise of the Cold War and a sort of newfound consensus around these issues, the return of genocide to Europe, genocide within East Africa, within Rwanda, that the international community was again galvanized to do institution building and to really think about what it would take to, to make what was a, meant to be an ad hoc and temporary tribunal at Nuremberg into a permanent institution. Institution. So it was a really heady time. Um, it, it felt um, exciting. It felt important. It was amazing to see these incredible diplomats negotiating with each other and watching the various models and proposals wax and wane and evolve over the course of the six weeks that we were all in Rome. And then these, these various proposals would come forward um, as sort of a package deal, and then states would be invited to, to comment upon them, and then the Bureau would take that back into this uh, kind of secret, private black box um, exercise, and then a new draft would pop, and then everyone would be reacting to that new draft, and then we finally got to the, the final Rome statute, and it was eventually open for signature. So, but you're from the United States, you're a states person, and are you uh, observing with a great deal of attention David Schiffer and, and his, his delegation? Yeah, it was fascinating to see. It was an incredibly large delegation. They took over an entire hotel, as I remember. It was an interagency de um, delegation from all various relevant agencies being represented. And one of the things that really struck home to me was speaking with one of the women, um, oh, what was her name? It will come to me. Um, she, I was just chatting with her over coffee where, you know, you do on the margins of these events. And I said, you know, what is your mandate? Like, wh what are you supposed to be doing here? Here was a DOJ lawyer normally doing prosecution. Minishrag was her name. Normally doing prosecutions in a domestic system. And she said, you know what? The only instruction that I was given was to make sure that this court is fair. Mm. That was it. That was what she was told to do. She had to use her best judgment on what international due process standards were, what would be expected in terms of the rights of the accused, what would be expected in terms of rules of evidence, and it was for her to use her best judgment, drawing upon other experts and her counterparts on the delegations of other, um, of other nations to come up with a fair system. That was what she was told to do. I'm envisioning a process where all of a sudden the, the guys in the black box <laughs> propose a document mm -hmm. draft three mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's then passed around oh yeah everybody we just everybody was waiting everybody redlines it yep does something it then goes back to the black box yep and you don't have access to the black box yep you probably don't even know who's part of the black box do you you know is there, is there, is there anybody in from the united states in the black box 
I don't recall whether there was. I don't know that there was because it was the chairs of the process. Um, so, but, but of course, I'm sure they were consulting with some of the strong states because it was a really strong effort to bring some of the large states along. There was a, a goal to have universal acceptance of the final draft and to address all of the equities that some of the stronger states cared about. And the United States at that time, to be fair, was in a somewhat unique position. They are often overextended. They have troops in a number of situation countries with the consent of those countries to help keep the peace, maintain the post-World War II you know, architecture of, of peace and security. And so they're uniquely vulnerable to being potentially prosecuted in the event that something goes terribly wrong within one of those situations. Um, and there was a need to be able to react and, you know, things happen in war. And so there was this sense of kind of somewhat unique vulnerability on the part of the United States. And they wanted to make sure that their equities would be, would be prevented, would be protected. At the same time, it was very hard as an American to see when the final statute went to a vote to see the United States in the seven states that voted against the final draft. That was a very disappointing moment for me. And while everyone around me was cheering, I remember being actually somewhat heartbroken that David Sheffer wasn't able to bring the U.S. delegation and the U.S. government back in Washington um, along in order to be able to support this, this um, final treaty. It wasn't perfect, but it addressed many of our concerns. And I think it's important to keep in mind that many of the provisions that we think about as being transformative and groundbreaking actually did have U.S. fingerprints on them. And so the U.S. was very instrumental in having a strong definition of crimes against humanity. The U.S. wanted to make sure that crimes committed in non-international armed conflicts would be fully cognizable before the ICC. That was not a foregone conclusion conclusion in the early days of the negotiations. It may have only because we had really only treaty precedent within the Geneva Conventions um, and the grave breaches regime for a system of war crimes in an international, a classic international armed conflict. And I think the United States was very instrumental in broadening that lens in order to see, and in fact was quite prescient, that many of the future conflicts would be more in the nature of non-international armed conflicts happening within the borders of a single state, even with some international involvement, but not necessarily strictly international armed conflicts. And again, all of the due process protections um, that the DOJ and others were really pushing for. And so many, many of the provisions that we think about as being core to the Rome Statute, the U.S. was very supportive of. But where it, its red lines were crossed had to do with jurisdiction and the fear that there might be politicized prosecutions because there was an independent prosecutor who could bring matters proprio motu, basically on her own motion, so long as the territorial state had ratified the treaty. So I mean, again, I hate to dwell on this, but you're down to the vote. I mean, there was a time where you say, we're going to vote. We're going to vote on this day, certain. Mm -hmm. Here's the final draft. Yeah, up or down. Yeah. And are you watching this on TV? Are you watching this play out? And did you know how the U.S. was going to vote? We did not know how the U.S. was going to vote. And it was not on TV. It was actually live in the large delegation room, the plenary room oh. of the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome. And they have on the wall behind the delegates the giant seating chart of the, um, of the room. And so everybody went to vote. And the, it's color coded how you have voted. And so we had, my little delegation had the presence of mind to take a photograph of the seating chart. And we were able to piece together the few states that voted against. And of course, there was the United States with the, I think it was red, green was yes and red was no. And there was the red, um, the red light that corresponded to the seat where David Sheffer was sitting. Now, if you've read his memoirs of this period, you know that he was not getting full and, and necessarily helpful um, instructions from Washington. Washington was slow to respond and the situation was evolving very rapidly and it was necessary to, as you mentioned, these, you know, rep these new drafts would be dropped at midnight the night before and states were expected to assimilate their views and be able to argue those views on the next day immediately. And so we were, no basically nobody was sleeping during these last couple of days of the Rome conference. And so, you know, he felt like he didn't have full instructions and he wasn't able to um, necessarily work with Washington in order to get new instructions that would reflect the new reality of where the treaty was landing. And so he was left with the necessity of voting no because those red lines were still contained in the final draft. 
uh, and I've, I've read it and I've tried to recall now, but uh, it, was it a function of the Department of State not being as focused or being distracted uh, as far as just David, you know? I don't know if it was that so much as I think there was an assumption that we could achieve more at Rome than was realistic. There was a very strong, like-minded group that had an enormous membership, cross-regional, and all of these states were, at the time, again, it was this sort of unique moment of consensus, very committed to a strong court that had some measure of an independent prosecutor. And there were a number of proposals put forth to govern the jurisdictional regime. And at the very far end, Germany had proposed what would be, in essence, a form of kind of universal jurisdiction. It didn't matter which state would have ratified the treaty. The court would have had jurisdiction so long as there was the commission of war crimes, crimes against humanity, or genocide. At the other end, there was a much more limited um, form of jurisdiction that the United States and some other states were advocating. And that would have required both the territorial state and the state of nationality of the accused to have ratified the treaty. And there were a number of proposals in between, including one that many NGOs were supporting, which was the custodial state. So the sense of if a perpetrator is on the, the state territory of a state party of the Rome statute, that should be enough to vest jurisdiction in the court. And where we landed was a kind of middle ground, which said that so long as either the state of nationality of the accused or the territorial state, the state on whose territory the crimes were committed, had ratified the treaty, then the ICC has jurisdiction and the prosecutor has the ability to move forward with the consent and approval of a pretrial chamber. Some, so there was a, a necessity if the prosecutor was, is, and, and this is the rule, going to move forward without a state referral or a security council referral, they have to put the case before a pretrial chamber to approve the case moving forward. And so that's where things landed. And I think because this was all happening at the last minute, the United States wasn't able to sort of come to terms with that particular regime. And so David Sheffer was obliged to, to vote no on the final treaty. And we're not in it, obviously. Uh, to this day, it's almost 25 years that have, have since passed. Has that impacted the capacity building of the staff? We just heard uh, the deputy prosecutor talk about trying to get uh, quality mm -hmm. people into mm -hmm. the ICC as the prosecutorial staff. I would assume, without anybody really saying this, the United States is not a party member. Anybody from the United States sort of doesn't rise in the list. Is that an accurate assessment? Well, not quite. So there have been some very senior United States um, experts mm -hmm. within the court. And someone like Alex Whiting comes to mind, who's now at the Kosovo Special Chambers. He had a very senior position in the office of the prosecutor. And so there have been some Americans there. but. The question is is accurate in the sense that in the early days of the ICTY, when I was there as a junior lawyer, being paid for by the Open Society Justice in Initiative, the Department of Justice seconded a number of very senior lawyers who had worked on big system crimes, who had worked on organized crimes. They had maybe had never done uh, a human rights case or a crimes against humanity case because we don't have that in our domestic code, but they knew how to work up a chain of command. They knew how to understand a system. They knew how to bring these extremely high profile, very complex cases when you have a system of criminality. And I think the ICTY really did benefit from that mm -hmm. expertise. Mm -hmm. And I think the ICC has suffered a little bit from that. Obviously, there are incredible lawyers there, and so I don't want to say no. that you know, that, you know, it would be, it would be. But in in the end, I think I would, I would hope that we would someday get to the point where the U.S. could second personnel. And I think that we have. Um, you know, we have a statute that governs United States cooperation with the court. Um, it prohibits direct funding to the court, uh, uh, a second statute. But the, the primary statute, the sort of omnibus statute that addresses this relationship, does not necessarily prohibit secondment so long as individuals are working on particular cases involving foreign nationals. And so we could maybe someday, I'm hopeful, get to the point where we're able to second an individual from our Department of Justice, perhaps our Human Rights and Special Prosecutions Unit, which incidentally has as its 
um, as its head, Teresa McHenry, who was very senior in the ICTY, brought the Celebici case um, and a number of other high profile cases and then went back to her career in the United States and has been running the, the Human Rights and Special Prosecutions Unit. She's now on a special detail and there are another number of senior lawyers who are now working within um, what we call HRSP to use the, the authorities that we have under our own penal code in order to bring cases in U.S. courts. Teresa also, the, was she at the Office of Special Investigations for a while? Well, so what happened was eventually the Office of Special Investigations that was led by Eli Rosenbaum, who's now our war crimes counselor for Ukraine, that was very focused on the Nazi cases, was merged with another office to create this new office of human rights and special prosecutions. And it has jurisdiction over the torture cases, the war crimes cases, the genocide cases, and the child soldier cases. And Congress is now working on a potential statute for crimes against humanity and also to broaden the jurisdictional basis for war crimes. And so that would really increase the authorities that HRSP is able to utilize when a perpetrator is discovered within U.S. territory. Mm -hmm. Because right now, without those authorities, we're often left with immigration remedies. And so if a person has lied upon an immigration form or they lied in connection with their naturalization processes, we can prosecute them for essentially immigration fraud. You still have to prove the underlying acts and so that they actually did participate in the persecution of others, for example. But what you ultimately are prosecuting them for is visa fraud. Yeah. So they can have quite serious sentences, but it's not the same. It doesn't carry the same expressive function as prosecuting that person for the underlying acts, the war crimes, terror, the, ter the, the torture, crimes against humanity, genocide, et cetera. So you're, I, 1988, 1998, excuse me, uh, you're there, this Rome experience. How does that experience, because you now career becomes just uh, meteoric, uh, how does that affect, how did that affect you? Well, it, it definitely instantiated a commitment to this work. Um, I ended up going into private practice because my fellowship concluded. The Center for Justice and Accountability couldn't sort of keep me on. They were a tiny, tiny organization. They had just been launched the year prior. They just didn't have the funds to keep me on. I was able to go into private practice and to bring one of the CJA cases with me. And so I was able to keep kind of a finger in this work um, and also to build out the support within the private bar for doing human rights work, doing pro bono work. And then, you know, at a certain point, I was kind of on a pre-partner track. I wasn't sure if that was the right path for me. And I learned that a position had opened up at Santa Clara Law School to teach international human rights. And so I ended up sort of applying over the transom and I got that position. And that enabled me to continue to build out my expertise in the field that I was passionate about. But because academia has a certain degree of flexibility based into it, I was also able to keep a hand in practice. And I always found that that enhanced my ability to be a good law professor was to keep my um, keep my connections with the practicing bar, what was happening out in the field when it came to international justice issues, human rights, etc. So I came here to Chautauqua. At a certain point, I gave a couple of the overview lectures. Um, David Sheffer used to run an event every year where he would do a kind of year in review of ICL, and so I did that lecture. I would try and follow things. I would try and keep up with it. Then the blogosphere sort of became a thing, and so I was an early member of Int Law Girls, repeatedly blogging on these issues, trying to be a part of the discourse and the dialogue. And it was through this, um, these outlets where I could be an academic, but I could also weigh in on issues of public import that were being negotiated at the you know, diplomatic world around, you know, the dip diplomatic fours around the world, that my work on the, the crime of aggression got recognized by the US delegation. And I got pulled aside at the annual meeting of the American Society of International Law by Harold Coe, who was then the legal advisor to the State Department. And he said, you're thinking about this in a way that nobody else is. And we, why don't we engage in this process? We've been absent during the Bush administration. The Obama administration and President Obama personally really wants to be a part of this review conference, but we're starting from zero. Do you want to come and be a public member of our delegation, which was an interagency delegation again? And so I said yes. And so I participated in a number of the preparatory meetings um, in Mexico City and elsewhere where the issues that were under debate were being discussed. And then I was able to be a part of the um, delegation in Kampala. And I, I distinctly remember at a certain point um, sort of saying to the delegation, I'm done here. Like now it's a matter of politics and negotiations. 
you know, I've advised you on the various options, what precedent exists, the ramifications of various approaches, but you know, you have to decide. And I couldn't see the instruction memoranda from Washington because it was classified. And so I didn't really know what our position was, what our red lines were, and so I could only guess at those and simply try and provide the best academic advice that I could. And I distinctly remember the final night, there was a question of whether or not the US would again be in a position where it would break consensus on the final text that had been reached during this two weeks and then you know several years, a decade almost, prior of negotiations. And I wrote a note to Harold Coe, I think it may have been on a napkin, in which I described my experience back in Rome and how disappointing it was and heartbreaking it was to see the United States break consensus. And I said, you know, I feel like we'd gotten a lot of what we need. We should feel protected by the various provisions. The, you know, other states, states' parties have negotiated in good faith with us. We've ended up with a good package. It doesn't get everything that we wanted, but it got a lot of what we wanted. Um, they were con particularly concerned with humanitarian intervention and not foreclosing the ability to engage in a military intervention in defense of individuals who were being subjected to other Rome statute crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, or genocide. And so they were concerned that the, the um, aggression amendments might chill exercises of humanitarian intervention, which President Obama was really um, supportive of, and it was the subject of his Nobel Peace Prize speech, if you recall. And so I, I didn't know, and so I you know, wrote this note and handed it to him, and then I went to the bathroom and I called my husband and I said, they're, they're in the room, they're making a decision, I'm not there, let's see what happens. And sure enough, in the moment, we did not break consensus. And in fact, nobody broke consensus. Um, there were a couple of delegations that came close, and in fact, there was a moment when we thought the Japanese um, delegation who had very similar views as we did with respect to the, the package of amendments. Um, but in the end, all the states that were at Kampala accepted the amendments and then they were ultimately opened for ratification. It's gonna make you feel pretty, pretty proud. It was, it was. I mean, we really put forth a good, um, a good showing and I think in, in very good faith wanted to get to a point where we could be accepting of this. Obviously we now get blamed because Russia and Russian citizens can't brought, be brought before the ICC for the crime of aggression because there's this dual exclusion. If, if both the, the sort of victim state has to be a member and the perpetrator state, the putative aggressive, aggressor state have to be members before the ICC can vest jurisdiction in the absence of a Security Council mm -hmm. referral, which of course we will not have with Russia now being the aggressor state. And so, you know, we get sort of blamed for that, but I think it's important to note that we were not the only state that was very concerned about a broad aggression regime and the other members of the P5 were similarly um, supportive of some of these amendments. And so we landed where we landed. And so that's why we've now um, created a situation in which we're having to consider whether or not it makes sense to create a standalone tribunal for aggression in the Ukraine situation, since that is so clearly, um, you know, a, a, a so clear and a, and a manifest violation of the UN Charter has been committed by Russia in its in connection with its reinvasion of Ukraine. But that's where we are, and so that it's really a question of whether or not the political will can be generated across the globe to create a standalone institution, or should the international community be investing and doubling down on existing institutions that are already operative, that are able to act immediately, and are engaging in the process now of full-scale investigations and in, on the Ukrainian side, prosecutions for the terrible war crimes that are being committed now across Ukraine. In your research and the presentation, did Jackson come up, you know, the whole Nuremberg, that was his pretty much his uh, torch was the crime of aggression. Was that part of your presentation? It was. I mean, in the sense that it was such a core crime of the Nuremberg Tribunal, and in fact, the tribunal, as I mentioned in my remarks, was meant to be the, the trial to end all war. And so it was, it was a fundamental part of the Nuremberg Charter. During the Cold War period, the international community was unable to come up with a consensus definition, and it took until 2010 to finally get to the point where we had a definition and a corresponding jurisdictional regime. But I think many people in Kampala felt very inspired by the post-World War II period and having someone like Ben Ferenz come mm -hmm. and essentially charging the states to um, make their best efforts and to find a way to make aggression be prosecutable before the ICC. Um, because in many respects, it is an original sin, right, that then launches and unfolds the following the crimes that follow from it. I mean, I think that was an inspiration for all states 
in Kampala um, as they, they felt they had this very weighty obligation to sort of make good on the, the provisions within the Rome Statute that envisioned it, the court ultimately prosecuting aggression and this you know deep history of which we're so proud um, and that essentially created the field of international criminal justice. So you're uh, Kampala and you're continuing to stay in academia, but at the same time, working in the blogospheres mm -hmm. and practicing, and I can uh, envision the times you were here and Stephen Rapp, I mean, mm -hmm. you were just kind of uh, together, you know, mm -hmm. working with him. Uh, I don't, know, I don't know if you were ever worked for him, but you were working with him. Well, I hadn't worked. I'd worked with him as part of the delegation. He and Harold Coe were the co-leads of the U.S. delegation to Kampala. But there is, you know, your question is actually more relevant than maybe you know. It was here at one of the IHL dialogues that Stephen Rapp pulled me aside and said, my deputy is stepping down and I need somebody new. We were at that theater, if you remember. Yeah, yeah, we had yeah, the, yeah. the, some of the sessions there sometimes. And I start racking my brain and going through my Rolodex and thinking, okay, who would be good? And the woman who was stepping down was Diane Ortlicker, who was an incredible academic, but also you know, had been working in many diplomatic sort of contexts and this and that. And I was trying to think of like, who would bring together that mix of skills? Um, and I hadn't clued into the fact that he was actually offering me the job at that point. <laughs> and so I said, well, yes, I'd be happy to. And then I realized I live in California. I have two small children. I have a husband who is, you know, in Silicon Valley and, you know, running a company there and this and that and like how to make this work. And so, you know, I called my husband later that evening and he said, of course, you have to do this. We have to find a way to make this happen. And so we worked together to figure out how to make this happen. And ultimately, I ended up commuting back and forth. We kept the kids with the, the, the degree of stability that we could in California, and I would come to Washington or then be flying um, where I was, wherever I needed to be. And with Stephen being on the road so often, it actually made sense for me to spend most of my time in Washington managing the interagency process and the intra-departmental process. And so that's the arrangement that we worked out. Um, and so I was able to be his deputy within the State Department in the same office that I now lead as the sixth ambassador at large. So he's the fourth. He's the fourth. And then there's a change of administration. Yep. And out goes Steve and presumably you. Yep. Uh, and then comes somebody else, new administration. Uh, do you remember getting the call? To be ambassador? Yeah. Uh, I do. And in fact, I had worked on um, the campaign for then candidate Biden. And in part because I wanted some role in the administration, obviously this was my dream role, but I was very open to any particular role. Um, and I co-chaired with David Crane, actually, which was a delight, um, a committee, a policy committee on atrocities prevention and civ civilian protection. And so we advised the campaign basically on these issues to the extent that they were coming up in the campaign or there were questions or things were happening in the press that they needed to be prepared to answer for and to be able to articulate what a policy would be in a, in a Biden um, administration. And so he, David and I worked together quite closely on that. And then many, many months went by and there was no talk of, we, we were all invited to apply. And so I wrote a very kind of generic cover letter in which I said, I want to work with this historic um, administration, whatever role you see as most valuable for someone with my skill set. here's what I've done in my life. Put me somewhere <laughs> but i didn't hear anything and so i was literally this close to accepting a position in the department of defense in the office of general counsel um, there's a role that often goes to an academic to help advise the general counsel and others just to bring kind of new ideas fresh um, insights into the work of the general counsel's office when i got a call that i was being considered for this position um, and so i was able to say that yes i would love that and i ended up withdrawing from the DOD position and then went through the interview process and then the long process of waiting for a confirmation hearing and then the long process of waiting for a vote. Um, and then interestingly, uh, President Zelensky was set to testify before Congress on a Wednesday. And on the Monday before, I started getting a number of journalist calls and there was some chatter. There's some chatter that my case, my situation might go to a vote before the Senate, the full Senate, because I'd gotten through the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but I was sitting on the Senate floor and a whole number of us were essentially frozen there because there were various holds on us by Ted Cruz and others. And so we were all sort of waiting for the, the final vote to happen. Um, and I got onto C-SPAN on Tuesday 
and was watching while I was getting dinner ready. And so I sort of had it on in the corner of my eye. And I never saw my situation. I thought, oh, it didn't happen. That's such a, you know, it's such a shame and maybe it'll happen again. And then I look at my phone and it's blowing up. And somehow I had missed that in fact they had voted on me and they had accepted me and so I was at that point Whoa. confirmed. <laughs> and as luck would have it, I was planning to fly to Washington the next day anyway, in part to do outreach on, in support of my um, candidacy. And so I kept the one-way ticket. <laughs> I just packed a different bag with all of a couple of suits and you know stuff that I would need and I, I uh, traveled to Washington and started the position. It, it had happened rapidly. I remember seeing you on television yes. and saying, oh, I know, I tell you what, I know who she yeah, is. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was Zelensky coming. I think they wanted to be able to say, we have confirmed our war crimes ambassador. Uh, and so I was able to then immediately start working on those issues um, and all the other issues presented by the office. But um, Ukraine was so salient at the time and there was a sense that we needed to be, have sort of an all hands on deck moment. And I think that's what in part popped, enabled my particular nomination to pop. Subsequently, you traveled with uh, Attorney General Garland mm -hmm. to, uh, with, was Eli on that trip too? He was, yeah, yeah um, he was to uh, Ukraine, what was that like? It was fascinating. So we um, originally went to um, Poland, to Zhezhe, which is on the border, and most of the U.S. Embassy had decamped um, to Zhezhe and other parts more broadly within Poland. So we had really very much a skeletal crew. And in fact, at, at a certain point when Kyiv came under attack, the embassy was basically abandoned and much of it was destroyed because there are sensitive issues there. And so they had that, they're, having, they're in a rebuilding mode right now because there was, it wasn't clear whether the Russians were just going to completely overtake the city, in which case, you know, this was almost like an Argo moment, right, in Iran, where we needed to make right. sure that yeah. things did not fall into the hands um, if Russia was, it was successful in that invasion, which fortunately they were not. Um, and so they're in a rebuilding mode. But many of the staff were in Poland. We then got in a motorcade and traveled to the border and crossed the border and met a delegation from the Office of the Prosecutor, then led by Irina Venediktova. And we were able to express our support for her work, the work of her office, her staff, many of her senior staff were there. Um, the Attorney General was able to announce the creation of this task force that would be very focused on how to prosecute these cases and how to be supportive of what's happening in the Ukrainian system. Eli's role as counselor on war crimes for Ukraine was announced. He's obviously an incredibly experienced um, prosecutor um, with a long history of understanding system criminality. And we were able to meet privately with her, just me, the Attorney General, and the Prosecutor General to continue to express our support for her work and to get her very candid assessment of what she needed, what her office needed. Um, and so, you know, that, that relationship has been ever since in my office, the Office of Global Criminal Justice, has some programming money now that has come from Congress to be able to scale that work. And so we've created the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group which is sending very experienced war crimes prosecutors who are veterans of the um, various international tribunals, many of whom you know, have been here in, in, uh, in Chautauqua for this event, um, to be able to work directly with the Office of the Prosecutor General, side by side with their counterparts, providing advice, strategic assistance, et cetera, how to deal with crime scenes, how the siege of Sarajevo was prosecuted, and how you could imagine prosecuting sieges of Mariupol and other cities within Ukraine, to bring to bear all of that expertise that we've developed now since um, you know, the, the, the creation of the two ad hoc tribunals to this incredible challenge facing now the Office of the Prosecutor General in, uh, in Ukraine. Without belying any confidences, uh, how do you find out what's going on in Ukraine? I mean, I, I tool in BBC yeah. who has unconfirmed reports from Ukraine, unconfirmed reports yeah. from Russia, yeah. and that's the sum total of at least I. Yeah. Looking at that, yeah, I, I, I assume you get different. Eh, yeah, again, without blowing in confidences. It's a huge challenge, obviously, and things are unrolling very, very quickly. Um, and every day there's new news. So I watch the news morning and evening. So I, I, I want to understand what the international community is seeing through open source channels like Ordinary News, CNN, Fox, um, you know, Al Jazeera, basically, you know, trying to triangulate all of that. I get an intelligence briefing on a regular basis, um, and it's usually quite thick. 
The um, U.S. government, I'm quite proud, has a war crimes brief that's based upon intelligence that is produced on a regular basis. And so they're really looking very carefully at some of the various war crimes and trying to identify who is responsible. So I'm able to consume that on a regular basis. We've created and stood up a conflict observatory that is trying to consolidate satellite imagery, open source evidence, scrubbing various telegram sites, social media feeds, et cetera pulling that together to do thematic reports. And so there have been reports now on attacks on hospitals, on educational institutions, on cultural property within Ukraine, and now most recently on the filtration system that has been established. And some very important revelations have come out within that reporting, one of which was that the filtration system probably was put in place prior to the invasion on February 24th, so very premeditated. And we've seen filtration operations in other situations in which Russia has been a combatant, uh, you know, a belligerent within those situations. And so seeing that those patterns of abuse repeat themselves now here within Ukraine has been incredibly interesting. And so it's very much about a matter of triangulating information that comes from the press, intelligence, our conflict observatory, and then civil society plays an incredibly important role. And so I'm constantly doing sessions with civil society actors, many of whom are Ukrainian organizations that are doing their own investigations on the ground. And so getting briefings from them as to what they're seeing when they're interviewing people or they're moving into situations in which Russian forces have um, have retreated and trying to get a, a kind of a ground truth as to what's happening on the ground. And, you know, everything you hear is horrific and it's much worse in many respects than what we're seeing on the news because the news cannot sustain this coverage. And so, you know, reading this on a daily basis, you realize just how horrific this situation is and how it's not the acts of kind of rogue units, but we're seeing incredible patterns across all areas where Russian troops have been deployed. And so it's really a question of extremely undisciplined troops to troops that are under orders to something in between. And it obviously will need a tribunal to be able to figure that out. But it's very clear that this is happening across Ukraine um, and that people are suffering terribly during this war. How much pressure do you feel that, uh, well, that, that your office might have to sort of at some point take the lead in how a tribunal may look? Or are you looking for other state actors to s react first and then you react? I mean, uh, do you feel pressure? Yeah, I mean, we're trying to keep up on all of the various proposals and talking to some of the norm entrepreneurs that are pushing these forward to really understand what they're, what they're envisioning. We're also speaking a lot with Ukraine. I mean, this is really ultimately about their own situation. And so what do the Ukrainians want? What do they envision? What does justice look like for them? How important is the, are the aggression charges versus all the other charges that might be brought? war crimes, potentially crimes against humanity, even allegations of genocide potentially with respect to certain um, crime bases that we're seeing. And so getting a sense of what their priorities are, but then also trying to understand where the international community is because the creation of a new institution is going to require significant investment um, in time, in resources, in personnel, in institution building, in information sharing. And there are a number of lines of effort that are already underway. And do we have the bandwidth to think about a novel new tribunal? Obviously, there are, are models that can be drawn upon, but there will be a certain degree of novelty here, in particular because we don't have the consent of Russia as the primary perpetrator state. With the special court for Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone was consenting to that arrangement. And so they had all sorts of r ways to ensure cooperation with the proceedings. We're not gonna get that cooperation with a Ukraine aggression tribunal. And so getting custody over the accused, getting the type of evidence that is necessary to determine who besides Putin is ultimately responsible, all of that is going to be an enormous challenge. And so we're in a sort of inquisitive um, stance, posture at the moment to sort of see what's out there and see whether any of these proposals have legs. And then I think we can determine whether or not it makes sense for the U.S. to be a part of this or to be more um, at a distance while this moves forward in, a, say, a European um, a European venue. And so we're at the stage now where we're, you know, trying to speak with everyone we can to sort of better understand what is being contemplated. 
what's a question I should be asking you? Um, you know, I think an interesting question is working in this field for as long as one has. Engaging in self-care, I think, is something that people often forget about. And I have, you know, trained myself through with colleagues at Stanford and elsewhere to be thinking about what vicarious trauma looks like because it is exhausting to be reading about what other people are experiencing and you do internalize that. I mean, part of the reason many of us are drawn to this field is that we have that sense of natural empathy and that we want to make a difference and we want to help people who are in pain. And so how to do that without internalizing all of that and ultimately undermining your ability to do this work well. And so I've worked with my team and with my students when I was at Stanford running the Human Rights Clinic to make sure that people are aware of what vicarious trauma is, how to protect against it, how to engage in self-care, how to know when it's time to step back, how to know where your own limitations are and not to feel at all self-critical if you need to take a break. Um, and I think that's something that those of us in the field don't do enough of because we feel like we have to constantly keep pushing ourselves. And so one of my main pieces of advice, in addition to sort of understanding how vicarious trauma works, is to have some kind of a physical practice. I think having that ability to focus on, you know, get out of your head, get out of the facts, and to just focus your attention in a meditative form of some sort, I think is incredible, incredibly important. And many people with whom I have spoken, including Leila Sadat, who's here, um, you know, have some kind of a physical practice, whether it be martial arts, or in my case, yoga, or being a runner. Melina Stereo is an active um, triathlete. My husband, you know, is a swimmer. You know, having something that en enables you to sort of work out some of that, the anxiety that comes with being in this field, I think is incredibly important. So self-care is something that I think many people neglect and don't pay enough attention to, but is something we should always have as top of mind. Well, it, it, it kind of begs the last, or one of the last questions is, we have a lot of people here at the International Law Roundtable that are students. Yes. And they're, uh, I don't, I don't want to say They're stars. young, they're idealistic, they're energetic. Right. Yes. I, I would have just simply said starry eyed, but yeah. uh, that's me. Plug. Okay. Good. You're on a roll. You're on a yeah, roll. good. Do you want to come through? We're paused. Okay, yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm just, go ahead. In my prior incarnation as an academic, I definitely spend a lot of time thinking about my students and what draws them to this work, how to inspire them to do this work. It's very much an exercise in proselytization. We want to bring more people into the fold, mm -hmm. more people into the work. And so doing that, but in a way that protects them and so that they come with um, a realistic set of expectations as to what this work entails and that it's not for everyone. For some people, they'll be very comfortable doing um, direct representation in court. For others, they're more suited for policy work. And so everyone can make a contribution to the field of international justice. And it's just really a question of what's the best role for you, given what your passions are, what your interests are, what your skill set is, and what your capacity is to deal with um, you know, the worst of, of humankind, essentially. And, but there's a role for everybody. And I say this even for my students who end up in private practice, because many of them feel like they wanted to be in public interest, but for financial reasons or otherwise, private practice makes sense for them. And I say there's still a contribution that you can make. My firm, Morrison and Forster, was incredible when it comes, is incredible when it comes to pro bono work. They've done a number of human rights cases over the years. And so, like I said, everyone can make a contribution regardless of what perch you're currently sitting on. Wow. Do I get a credit for this? For sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, what a class. Well, I should say thank you and thank you to the Jackson Center and thank you to the organizers. I mean, this is 
an event and a gathering and a convening that I think many of us really look forward to because it is an opportunity to recharge your batteries, to reconnect with people who care about these issues so passionately, who have made so many incredible contributions to the field. I come away feeling like I've learned much more than I've contributed, and that's always the sign of a good conference, I think, and a good, a good gathering. And so this is something that I, I have, I've participated in in many different roles, and now it's just wonderful to be here as the ambassador at large for global criminal justice. Is there extra pressure on you? Because now you are speaking among friends, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's being filmed for posterity, mm -hmm. and you are the government. It is, and I think that was why I made very clear in my very remarks good. today that I was not articulating a government position. Um, I have found that my talking points are often my friend because I know that I have a consensus on the points that are in my talking points, and I don't want to get out ahead of the government. I don't want to embarrass the secretary, for example, if I say something that is not consistent with where U.S. policy is, then he could be asked a question and be caught in a, a bind and not know how to answer if he gets told, well, your ambassador at large has said blah, blah, blah. And so I find my talking points are an asset. And so I work very carefully with my staff and with others around the government to, you know, try and send the message that I want to send personally in this role, but also make sure that I have the support of my colleagues who are on the same page and who are are willing to essentially implement whatever I'm promising or saying that the US government is doing. And so um, in that respect, it's it's difficult in the sense that I'm in a different role, but at the same time, everyone I think here understands the role that I'm in and respects that mm -hmm. and knows that I'm doing my best to make sure that the United States is ultimately supportive of the system of international justice. We will able to be, be more supportive in certain contexts than others, but we're constantly looking for ways. And this administration in particular has invested in this work. I have been told personally that I should be pushing as hard as I can and doing as much as I can to be able to advance this system. And so that is how I have approached the role. And I, I have been working across the government to try and bring some more hesitant elements along to, so that they can understand that ultimately this will put the United States in a stronger position vis-a-vis um, -vis the international community when we're seen as a, a, a reliable partner in this work. Wow, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And congratulations once thank again. You. Thank you.